<laughs> Patrick, we've got an issue. What's the issue? I told you it was episode 180. It's not. It's 179. 179? Can you do another intro for me? <laughs> Are you going to splice in a completely different environment? I'm no, absolutely. So it's uh, 179. We were one up ahead. Yeah. Can you can you just wing it? Uh, can I wing it? Yeah. Hi, I'm Patrick. Welcome to the 179th episode of the Services Action. So welcome back to a brand new episode of the Service Design Show. This is going to be a very special edition because we're actually doing a live in-person conversation, I think second or third time in the history of the show. And I'm here at the heart of Service Design in the US. I'm in the Harmonic Design Studio in Atlanta. Thanks for inviting me, Patrick. Yeah, it's great to have you here. And uh, Patrick, you're a returning champion you've been on the show before Do you recall which one yeah. which episode it was it was during the pandemic so it's all blur uh i would say what was i maybe midway through your 170 or 80 could be yeah it could yeah. be and uh since then we joined forces uh you have been a partner of the of the show people might know you from the show they also might know you from the book which was also celebrating an anniversary five years yep May 1st, yeah. Orchestrating experiences. We'll get into that a bit later. Yep. Um, so, Patrick, uh, I'm really excited for this. Uh, I already told you we got a bunch of questions also from your team um, that might be a bit different than you'd expect. Uh, so let's jump into this and, okay. and see where we end up. First question is uh, about the future of our profession, about the future of service design. Mm -hmm. If you think about where it's heading, What's the thing that excites you most? I'm excited about the impact that service designers can have. Um, you know, in the U.S., uh, the roots, I think, are still sinking into the soil in a lot of organizations. Um, and for ones that I've seen make the investment, building internal teams, hiring partners to work with them or help them build those teams, um, I think the future is bright for the profession to grow here. Um, but I also, probably you have questions about this later, but I think it's also going to require to continue to really push and evolve what service design is and what it means. Um, it has to be responsive to the needs of organizations in the world around us. And so um, I'm really excited about the future, but it's going to require continuous innovation of what 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 we do mm. um and and redefining the boundaries of it um i think is going to continue to be very important and when you think about the boundaries of our profession right now what's the thing that we would need to redefine you know i in 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 talking to different teams and leaders um talking to different the few schools that teach it looking at curricula um I, I still think that a lot of a lot of practitioners are under uh, they're under indexing on operations mm -hmm. and culture. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of organizational design, business design that I think is really critical. Um, I think over the last few years, the more and more people are understanding the intersection of systems thinking and in more systemic service design i think that is a sign that our profession is looking at our complex world and the organizations that you're trying to work with them and responding to that uh, there's been a lot of people that have been voices for that for a long time mm -hmm. i'm seeing more of that starting to bubble up i'm seeing it more being taught um i think that's incredibly important um i think the Obviously, within a lot of organizations, the push to digital transformation sucks a lot of oxygen out of a lot of opportunities and where it could be going. And I think we have to continue to kind of cut against that grain because I think organizations uh, need more than digital services. Mm. Are you optimistic about the future of service design, maybe especially in the U.S.? It's hard to say now, obviously. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, in the, in the U.S., like other parts of the world, we're seeing a recession. Um, I believe that service design 
is a you know a form of strategic design. In recessions, companies start to pull back the horizon lines a little bit, start to look on how can we uh, perform in this recession, pull back on investments, innovation. And obviously service design plays across that whole gamut from new things and making existing services better. Um, so if you look at it from this point of view, we've been seeing layoffs in the US in service design. Um, but that's been true of of lots of more strategic positions. It's hitting engineering and technology. I think it's I, I think it's a blip in terms of the investment that companies will make in this. But it does mean that service designers have to, whether you're internal or external, you've got to be able to um, speak to the business impact of the work. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Like in the long term, it may, yeah. it's going to benefit the entire. Yeah, I, community. Yeah, I mean, back in 2008, when we had the um, a bigger recession here, based off of the um, crisis around home loans, uh, that was a much bigger mm. challenge to the design profession. Mm. I remember, I was leading a team of about um, 30 something people. And I remember standing in front of them and saying, All right, so this is where we've got to get innovative. Mm. We have to like figure out new methods. We've got to be able to talk more about the value of what we're doing as designers. Um, and during that time period, that's when a lot, uh, you know, a lot of the lean approaches to different design professions kind of like matured during that time period, right? Because you had to be able to show you could uh, work with less, right? Um, so I think, yeah, every challenge is an opportunity, right? So yeah, I think it's a good time for reflection. And I'm seeing amongst um, people that I think are leaders in our space, seeing them uh, make some better and better, more compelling arguments mm. for, for the, the value of what we all do. So yeah, so I, I'm overly optimistic about it. Um, but yeah, we have to stay on our toes and keep pushing. Um, uh, and, and, and educating in a way that's not just academic, we mm -hmm. have to do it in a here is the value of making this investment and trend and 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 you know I think I've always believed in doing small things build to the bigger things and so smaller ways to make an impact um, to build confidence of leaders to invest more mm. right I'm here in Atlanta this is my I think second or third visit which was the other ones were quite long ago and I learned already in the days that I'm here two very important things apparently everybody has their own mac and cheese recipe and <laughs> everybody loves the beach um and your favorite beach is Rehob Re help me rehoboth rehoboth yes. beach so yes my next question is related to uh, to this let's imagine that you got the opportunity to create a service design cocktail inspired by rehoboth beach <laughs> what kind of cocktail would it be and what emotions or experience would you want the cocktail to invoke in its consumers hmm. so tell us first a bit more about the beach and why you yeah, so, enjoy it so much yeah so a lot of people are like uh Robert beach is in delaware so the the first response to people in the u.s is why delaware <laughs> and that this the answer is pretty simple uh best friend of mine we've known each other since we were five years old uh, has a place there. We visited him for years. Um, their cocktails there are very, uh, the, the po most popular things there currently are like vodka with a fresh squeezed fruit in it, uh, which is not my thing. So I'm more of a bourbon person. Um, so I would be cutting against the grain by making bourbon drinks <laughs> in Rehoboth. <laughs> But I'm a big fan of old fashioned, so I would, I would probably uh, try to start to to build more uh, of an appreciation for for uh, a mix uh, for old fashions. But it probably would have to incorporate some sort of uh, uh, orange or uh, or lemon uh, kind of taste. Maybe the bitters would be lemon bitters or orange bitters, for example. So, so what what would that cocktail message? What would be 
Uh, it would message that uh, the goal is I retire there at some point. So it would message I'm here. I'm old. <laughs> and, and welcome. Welcome me to the party. <laughs> All right. But yeah. Yeah, we need to make that happen. Uh, add it to your bucket list. Yeah. A service design cocktail. Yeah. Um, so, Patrick, another reason why we're here is that Harmonic also recently celebrated its fifth year anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure a lot has happened in those five years. And I'm going to um, probably pose a pretty challenging question. If you have to think back on your proudest moment in those last five years, mm -hmm. is there anything that pops to mind? Um, it's probably, you know, we're five years old. So if you, if you track back, we were under two years old when the pandemic happened. So... I would say proudest moment is how we, this team here, um, just very nimbly adapted to it. So I, I'm sure a lot of people have similar stories of how you just had to overhaul everything that we're doing, how we're approaching working with clients um, in a, as a young company and still building our client base mm. and our reputation to be able to do that and then grow during it. Um, what was the secret? Um, when, when we formed, I, a big believer, we, you know, we're a small company, but even as we've grown, my goal has always been that, um, that people, uh, that we have a very open discussions and talk about what we're doing, where we're going, how we're working together. So I think that that and and how we work together is just so such a foundation to be able to then communicate to one another um we've always had a uh you know one of my values has always been to bring in the company is taking care of one another so we all leaned on one another mm. um and then when we were starting the company you know we opened up for people to take a piece of building the operations of this company beyond um beyond working with clients in our in our practice and so um everybody just kept taking a piece and figuring out mm -hmm. like how do we how do we adapt and 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 uh how we're working together and to give each other feedback about it um we also just slowed down some things and said it was interesting we we grew but we were slowing down those goals it was very interesting um because i just wanted people not to feel overloaded i think we all there was all this initial buzz when the pandemic first happened, the first three or four months was very obviously disconcerting and destabilizing for everybody. But there was this weird energy of like, yes, we can, you know, do this. And then it's kind of like you get the take a deep breath and go, oh, we're still in this. Right. Um, and so I think the other thing is just encouraging people to take time, um, take care of themselves, um, hold back on a few of our goals things like we're doing this week here in Atlanta of our practice week were goals that we had back then. And we just, you know, iced it for a while. Um, and when we felt ready and had the energy that mm -hmm. we would do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's that, um, yeah, the team just did an amazing, amazing job and, uh, and leaned on one another. What surprised you the most? Because I can't imagine that going through a pandemic, um, seeing client work change, uh, doubting if client work will still be there. Mm -hmm. uh, it took us two years to get through the pandemic sort of fully. If you now look back on that, what's the biggest surprise coming out of it? You know, I'm, it's been, you know, the way that organizations work and there's still headlines of where people work and is it hybrid and get back to the office or don't come back to the office. I. I think over, I think we all have to remember what it while, while there's different perspectives on work life. Mm -hmm. I think we should all kind of put things in perspective of what a what a crazy experience to go through together as humans, and that a lot of and a lot of people are doing doing their best, mm -hmm. right? And we all bring different ideas and and values. So you know, I'm why well, I'm like I was saying before, I'm optimistic of service design. I was surprised by companies, you know, just a lot of our clients were under, like us, were 
in some sort of form of trauma from this experience we were going through. And while there were some tough moments along the way, overall, I felt that people were kind to one another mm -hmm. um, and trying to do their best work together. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, maybe that's not a surprising thing. It's probably the depth of it. I don't know. It just felt, you know, I was very appreciative of why well, I'm always, of course, like we're a business, we, we get paid for what we do. You know, it's very valuable for us to like, we try to show up being our best and when our clients were as well, when we we're all struggling and trying to figure out how do we even work together, uh, much less accomplish what we're trying to do. I'm just appreciative of it. So I don't know if I swerved on your question, but that's what came to me. Yeah, Let's hope that uh, that's, that's going to continue and we don't lose that appreciation and that respect yeah. for each other now once everybody yeah. starts adding things to their to-do lists. Yeah, I mean, we know that what service designers do is, you know, there's a lot of craft to it, but obviously facilitation and bringing people together and creating alignment and so much of it is that we show up with energy. Mm -hmm. We ask the same mm -hmm. from others. Um, and so, yeah, I think um, we obviously all have to model that in our profession, um, but it, 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 you know, yeah, it was, it's just a, like I said, I agree. I hope that can, that continues. I hope people don't forget how everyone was trying to bend and be flexible and try to get stuff done. And then it doesn't return to, re, you know, rigidity that you see in some organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it was, uh, some good lessons learned in that. And like I said about the recession, like every time something happens like this, it just, you know, it accelerates practice development. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. so, it is. Yeah. yeah. Never waste a good crisis in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, let's talk about the book for a second. Uh, you're a best-selling author, uh, recognized. And... I, I, I don't know how best. <laughs> <laughs> We've had your co-author on the show as well, Chris yeah, Risden, right. oh. and the book is there behind us. Uh, I don't know if I have a signed copy. I do have a copy somewhere. Um, the book is titled Orchestrating Experiences. Have you seen organizations generally be able to orchestrate their experience? There's a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, well, you know, in the book, that's a uh, intentionally has two meanings, right? So, you know, if you look at the experiences as they were provided to customers or other people, there's the um, ability to um, create these experiences over time and, and especially in companies that operate in more than one channel, which most do, how you um, how that comes together, and um, you know, ideally, customers move fluidly through reaching their goals, and the system of touch points responds to them. Uh, there's a lot of work to do there. I think there's a goal in a lot of organizations. You know, there's more journey work happening. There's more journey management work. I think there's still the maturity level, I think, of how you get to the goals of journey management mm -hmm. versus how you do it. There's a lot more work to do, but that, you know, in, in, I don't know, I think I did my first journey map like 15 years ago. So like, if you look at the trajectory of that over time, maybe longer, um, the trajectory is good. I think more people are, are trying to, to determine that. I think one of the barriers to it is less technological or methods, uh, the intent. I think it's the other thing we talked about in the book, um, which is how you work together. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, you know, an organization being able to, you know, work together towards that end to have a vision and believing that experiences are really material to how they create value, that it's not something that you just kind of chip away at in an agile team over here and the communication team over here, um, that you have to have, you have to work together and there have to be people helping to see the forest while, they're, while the trees are being created. I think that's where there's a lot of struggle. And I think that's true of any 
you know, companies have tried to move to agility. It, it's the same challenges. It's a, it's humans, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, like getting people to work towards this bigger goal and how you balance um, having that clarity of what you're trying to create and orchestrate versus the two week cycles of getting stuff done. Um, that messy middle between strategy and implementation is still ripe mm -hmm. for doing better work. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's more and more of a stated goal that organizations have the same way that like 20 years ago would be customer centered. Mm -hmm. And now you hear about journeys, mm -hmm. right? So, um, but I think there's, it's a challenge because if you look at customer centricity, you know, um, walking that talk has been a struggle. And so journeys to me are an even greater challenge, right? Um, but, uh, but I'm optimistic about the seeing it more and more in organizations making that investment, but they're still, everyone's still trying to figure out how to do it well. Yeah. I think, um, literature like this definitely contributed to growing demand, growing awareness, and then the execution part is still something people are trying to figure out, even though it's already written down, but the fact that people are asking for it, uh, trying to learn about this stuff, that's already a big win. Although we always want things to move faster, but. Yes, yeah, I'm, yeah, I t tend to take a longer view, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's, you know, and I'll tell people, you know, when I'm, we're working with a company and they're, everyone wants, you know, or many people want like that best practice shortcut. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and I'll literally say it, even though I wrote a book, yeah. this is like, you're not going to find the answer in a book. You're going to find signals, clues, pieces, but your organization, while you can see patterns across them, you're your own weird mm -hmm. little universe <laughs> and uh and it comes down to people working with people yeah and uh so that's what you know and so i would say that's um you know in the book the last chapter talks about that a lot which is just this is little step by little step making change um building coalitions of the willing mm -hmm. um it can't be you know some of it can be education but a lot of it is just trial and error you know when you get the opportunity to speak to people who have read the book what's the biggest misconception they have after hearing the story i don't no one doesn't come to mind mm. um to be honest i i think overall i mean i've been i've been you know there was a um when chris and i were writing it it was always this the struggle of there are there's not one way to do this right but you have to make it tangible. So we were trying to balance this, you know, little philosophy, a little bit of the mindset you need to have, the concepts, and then, yeah, this tool, that tool, this change over time. Um, I think, I, you know, the, the, the workshop examples in it, I think one of the, um, it shows a way to do it. And I, I'm happy there wasn't a misconception of that is the way to do it. At least when I talk to people that they've tried it, they've adapted it. Um, but no one said, Hey, I did it exactly like you wrote it down. And, it you know, it was trying to make it just really concrete of, um, and it was a little bit of how for each of those things, like focus on your outcomes, you know, so that's, that's been, that's been good. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. We also, um, at the time made a conscious decision not to say, you know, service design on mm -hmm. the cover. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was we were, we were trying to pull from lots of different things in it, obviously. And so it's interesting that, um, uh, as many people will see it as a service design book as not. And that was, that was intentional because, because, you know, in the U S especially still trying to have people understand what it is. And there's always a, do you lead with that or not? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the end, we just decided like, we just want people to do good work, help, yeah. <laughs> help them. If this helps you do good work, call it whatever you want. Yeah. Um, and so that was an intentional decision. And so that's been, that's been nice, mm -hmm. um, as well. 
if you now five years later had to add a single chapter to the book, what would be? Yeah, would be? I uh, wrote a blog about this a couple of years ago. Um, we'd, we, I know more now too. Um, the in the book, there's a chapter on journeys that I think would blown out moments even more. Mm. Um, but that's become a big part of our methodology here. But there were things that when Chris and I were working at Adaptive Path together and with others there, like Jam and Hageman and others, like the things that we were working on in our practice when we were writing the book, um, we were just where Chris and I were in our thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would be it. And then, you know, I, I would say when we turned our outline in, what Lou Rosenfeld, the publisher, told us was this is three books <laughs> so one way to think about it is, is there's 11 chapters like nine chapters or one book uh, chapter 10 is a book that i think chris really wanted to write just getting deeper into um, prototyping and implementation and then the last chapter was kind of like what I, a lot of stuff i wanted to write about which is i think a lot of what we do at harmonic is more about the intersection with organizational design and like how do you change how do you get these things into organizations how do you evolve in using these approaches um so yeah so it might be a missing book <laughs> um but uh yeah those are i think those those are things that come to mind but yeah the, i think the use of moments as part of the architecture of organizations mm -hmm. we've been doing a lot of experimentation and uh but again you know what you know when you write it i mean that book came out five years ago right. but you know you really have to lock what we were going to write about even a year and a half before that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's interesting. It's like a, it's kind of a, a, for me, it feels like a good historical document of like my thinking in 2016. And yeah, I've definitely learned so much from since then and, and watching my team just like do some amazing work. That's why we're all waiting for a revised version, <laughs> like a new and updated. Lou, if you're watching. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he definitely is. I know he is. So, um, Patrick, I know uh, you're a big fan of game night to recharge and mm -hmm. get back into, get back on the energy. Um, please help us to take us back to a moment where there was a particular hot situation with a client where you definitely needed game night to <laughs> get back on your, in your rhythm. I mean, definitely there were moments during the pandemic where, like I was mentioning before, like in general, everyone's trying to show up mm -hmm. the best they can. But we definitely, you know, and I think this will probably resonate with people. You, you're working on something and uh, we work in a very collaborative way with our clients. And uh, there is definitely on one initiative, a kind of clashing of methodology. So I think- Maybe there, more specific? Yeah, there was, um, uh, you know, within the branding and marketing world, um, uh, I think there was at, at this client, I think there was a kind of approach of using some frameworks that they were comfortable with, um, but they were hiring us to do things differently intentionally. And uh, I think as the project was very high profile project in the organization, it's a very large company, C CMO level uh, visibility. So I think it's uh, one of those times where our team is trying, we work very, we're very flexible, but it was getting to the point where it's like, um, no, this is breaking, right? Like the logic of the work was starting to just fall apart. So we, you know, it was very stressful and this was during the pandemic, right? So like already just life stressful. And so emotions were very high amongst everybody as a result. So yeah, definitely had to like collect my thoughts on the whole team and definitely work, we worked through it. And, um, but it's, uh, I think those are the things where how you handle those moments. I talked to my teams a lot about that of, you know, best laid plans. Right. And a lot of the work we do fortunately is important to these companies. Um, it's often has this dual thing that I think a lot of service designers face of, you're trying to you're being hired to introduce new things but then as you go through it there's a pull within organizations to the norm right um and how you navigate that together 
Um, either sometimes it's the people you're working with in the client and they're having to work with that around them. Sometimes it's within the team, but yeah, just being able to work through that. And, you know, and a lot of, I think like a lot of designers who come from a human centered background still practice that way. We're highly empathetic. I'm an introvert. So these things weigh on me. Mm -hmm. um, um, you take it personal. Not personal, but it takes a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I take it personal. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I I have a, I believe service design, like with what we're doing and we're trying to create these things that ultimately we're trying for all the people involved to win. Mm -hmm. So it's like, am I the customer? Am I employee delivering the service? Am I impacted by it three degrees away? Can we figure out ways to balance that? Um, so that's how it feels to do a project too. So it's so when you when I go through those, I'm like, I just want us all to have a good experience and and listen and help one of those needs. But these, you know, there's moments where it's just really hard to to navigate it, and uh, that's when I need to recharge because that energy. I don't get energy from that. <laughs> I'm going to be exhausted after we finish talking. Right? So um, it's the, it's that that kind of thing. So, but that's um, you know, a, I mean, a big part of like I was saying earlier. You know, it's people working with people. So you have to show up and, and work through that. And it takes that energy. And then you got to take care of yourself. Any specific lessons that you took away from that experience? Um, you, to, uh, it, it's okay. I, I would say that, uh, why we, I say we're very flexible, um, you know, to bring forward things as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Right. I think um, it's not uncommon in client relationships where you're trying to be responsive and then we'll figure that out you know but um a lot of this work in a lot of the model we've been doing here it's um you know you're really building a team together so you have to be able to create and we really have worked on as a practice like how do you create that ability to like the merits of who you work for can you create the right um climate on the on the on the project or the initiative in, within the team to be able to have those conversations and uh and tackle things before the trajectory gets too far off mm. and sometimes it's the reverse like we're we, we think we're doing what's what's best and they're not feeling comfortable but they may be going well we'll trust them they should bring it forward <laughs> so it's uh it's a two-way it's a two-way street we're, we're all trying to do our best and i think that's how we try to we try to signal as like let's just um good communication you know and don't uh don't try to get it out and uh, and and not have those uh conversations when you need to have them mm. yeah so this is a nice leeway into uh my follow-up question um in your early years you ran an ice skating rink Skating rink? No, soccer no? shop. A soccer shop. Yeah. I need to I need to double check my info here. But a new skating I, rink. No. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. There we go. When I was a little kid. When you were a little kid. I was a roller skating rink. A roller yeah, skating. I was rink. a little entrepreneur when I was uh a little kid, yeah. So uh <laughs> skating rink, soccer shop, I knew that as well. Yeah. Now the question here is how did that influence your leadership style today? All those things, I mean, I have a partner, James, here. I wrote a book with Chris. I, I'm more, I'm a, I lean towards collaboration. And, and when I think about those things, like the soccer shop was with my dad, uh, those things that I did as a kid, I was sometimes the person who was the spark for it, mm -hmm. or, but I was also, if someone had an idea, mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh, let's, let's do that. I, I think that's, and that's, you know, the way I, the way I try to lead is, um, you know, I definitely have responsibilities in a role um, as a owner of the company, or if I'm leading something with a client. But uh, I, I always think of it as we're doing this together. Mm -hmm. I try to show up that way, um, create the space for all of us to think through how to how to do this together. Um, and and that's what I've tried with clients as well. Um, I I believe that leaders should be. I think that everyone on the team, no matter if you're like right out of school, or you've been doing it for twenty years, we all know something. We all have a perspective that is unique and valuable, and 
that that's how I try to show up. And I encourage my teams to do that. Um, I think when, I think when, I think poor leadership is when it, it develops into leaders and followers, like almost the term leader sometimes is a mm. bucker, right? Mm. Um, because that says there's follow. I mean, I've worked with some companies where it's almost like a paternal relationship of leaders and employees. And, and I always say leaders are employees. Mm. <laughs> um, so, so it's this little dance of like, you know, being supportive of one another. If it's not your idea, just because you people look at you as the leader, like BS and to it, you know, um, help one another. Um, so I think it's that I think I, as a as a kid, I always, you know, I was captain of my soccer team, but like I was surprised they wanted to make me, you know, and uh, and our, our coach was surprised. He's like, are you sure? Because I am more introverted and quieter, and but um, but I am about the team. Mm -hmm. So I think I think those are things I learned at a very young age. Um, that I don't know, still it's about the team. Yeah, yeah, it's about the team. So oh, there's I'm guessing an interesting balance towards um, moving forward together as a team versus. I'm I'm assuming that you also have a vision where things are heading. The company celebrated. 50 year anniversary when you go for a walk or have a game night you're probably thinking about okay what's next what's going to happen in the next five years i want to know about that and if dublin also plays a role in that story uh all my friends in dublin hey tim um uh i don't know business wise any excuse i ever so yes i have a love of dublin um so any excuse to get over there. But, uh, you know, I, I definitely have thoughts uh, in terms of where I think things are happening. I try to share that with the team, but it's also listening to them. So, you know, um, if we're not connected to what we're doing, if every practitioner here, then, you know, you lose some of the advantage of being a small external party, right? Um, and so, Part of the answer of the like what's going to happen over the next five years will be dependent on the people who aren't in this room um, and um, helping to um, take their passions and see can we turn that into something that um, are we addressing a need that that's there are we helping people see a need that they have that we can help address um, but connecting our passions to what organizations need um I think what I see most clearly is that, and I was just talking to an owner of another service design firm the other day, is just how, as an external party to working with organizations of different kinds, how our how we work with companies will continue to need to evolve, mm. and that's what I see most clear. And we we've leaned into that. Like I still consider the way we've been practicing as experimental um we've been we've been experimenting with engagement approaches that we've learned so much about what to do what what will work and not work and then you tried another organization and i think what we're still trying to find um are, are, are the partners that we really look for in organizations really want to do it together mm -hmm. and um and the ones that have really leaned into that model have shared that that has been a more enjoyable way to work um and they've seen the outcomes it's definitely enjoyable for us <laughs> um and so i think over the next five years like what i what i hope i would see is is that we are able to help you know continue to push on how we work with organizations and lean into the things i was talking about earlier which is how organizations can be more tuned oriented to service mm -hmm. um and that word service and service design i think is the should be a real focus for in our profession the 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 there's obviously mental models about what design means within companies right and that's always sh shifting and changing and um but i think that a service economy <laughs> 
service organizations that provide services, uh, that's the playing ground, I think. And that's the business relevance, right? Because then design becomes a, a way that people see you get to those outcomes. But what outcomes are we talking about, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and what that word service means and can people, can organizations and leaders really lean into that more and more versus um, digital or transformation or all these words that are thrown around. I really think service versus, you know, customer centricity is very important because as an organization, you need to create, retain those customers. But I think that um, service and um, my vision would be that organizations continue to realize that the customer experience and employee experience are the same problem mm -hmm. ultimately mm -hmm. that's that is the service um ecosystem that you're trying to make healthy right that everyone is thriving within what you're trying to to do in the world um so i would love that five years from now that more organizations were seeing that investing in it and embracing and, yeah terms like service yeah. journeys uh growing their vocabulary awareness exactly and that's and moving away that, from product because it was delivering products these days nobody but still there in yeah that language yeah i mean it's you know a service technically is a form of product but i do think that word product is still a barrier we probably talked about this last time <laughs> I, I could keep going but um yeah i i do think this this you know the bit the a, a big goal that i think a lot of service designers have is that shift right yeah. is can we can the mentality move from um yeah we're we're trying to to move things off the conveyor belt in a new way that's not waterfall uh but are we still focused on outputs over outcomes and are we still focused on uh, are we not focused enough on creating these you know like the idea of service of like human to human service when a, so every organization i've talked to that's going through digital transformation says but how do we keep the human touch mm -hmm. you know especially if a com if an organization has been around for more than 20 years that's their they believe that's part of their dna mm -hmm. and the answer is well if you if you use the approaches from service design if you use service dominant logic if you think of service orientation you're essentially trying to figure out how the interaction between two people um how do you do that at a scale that's often mediated through technology mm -hmm. and it's not through industrial approaches mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. so um that's the big change yeah. <laughs> so five years from now we're probably still working on it but i think that's the, that's the trajectory um and what that means for our business and how we're doing it we're going to just continue to be sharp on evolving but that's the north star and we're seeing more and more role models and i think that's the good thing there are more and more companies publicly stating this like recently airbnb putting out a statement around this so that that helps right? yeah when yeah yeah i was, like that I was glad they up. i was glad they did that because um you know being out in san francisco and doing a little work with them you know they that's their dna they have been doing versions of it for a long time and when they you know when they um when they're um i forgot who it was but the in, the uh venture capitalist firm that worked with them originally you know they did a case study and like put out the storyboards that they had and uh that example if i just show that to people of like mm -hmm. like this it, you know it clicked right of oh okay so that's like a journey and though those are moments mm -hmm. like okay i got that so when they do something like that it it is incredibly um you know it's such a service to service design mm -hmm. to and to doing good work to helping companies understand like the and and to have a, the founder do that right that it, this is not um that's in, in, at their scale. This is just and how close he is still to um, the importance of that, mm -hmm. um, and how that keeps their company oriented around their not just their business model, but the, pe the experiences that people have that mm -hmm. make it work. Like it's just yeah, 
that'll be one we point to for five the next five years, right? It's supposed to be a ripple, uh, create a ripple effect. I hope so. I hope so. I was very, very excited. I saw a lot of people posting that, and I think we should be all trying to draft off of their reputation and, and that example. He's the next one I'm going to invite on the show. You should, yeah. I, we need to have this Yeah, I've met him. He's a good guy, yeah. He's All right. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, we'll exchange details later. <laughs> so um, we discussed uh, clients uh, a little bit. Now, I'm really curious. I don't know how often you do this, but if you go out and take your client out for dinner, mm -hmm. what would be the perfect dinner? And if you could invite a band, a music band, would Boy Genius be part of that? <laughs> well, dinner. Well, I would, I would be hostly, first of all. So it would be what they would want to uh, have for dinner. But, um, uh, and it would depend on where we are, because I, I would lean towards where the, the good food is in town. Um, but, uh, you know, if, they were, if there was their first time in Atlanta and we were going out to dinner, I would, uh, if they were adventurous, I would, they have, we have an area called Buford Highway that just has a lot of, uh, great international, like every few blocks, it's like you're entering a different country. So that would be really great to do. Uh, but yeah, probably, you know, the firm I used to work with, we were really big on taking people to sushi. Mm. I might do that. Mm -hmm. Um, music wise. Yeah. Yeah. Boy Genius is good. They just played in Atlanta. Um, yeah, I'll stick with that for now i have uh, my music taste changes constantly well that, so, that's uh, part of the uh the, the design dna yeah uh, yeah i will say for uh i will say that yeah there were some shows here in town this weekend but i would say idols uh from the uk tore it up so i would say i, I might play idols that's not great d dinner music <laughs> depends on the dinner so uh if we flip the table and sort of think service design how has that influenced your life so rather than you influencing the craft how has the craft influenced you in your personal and professional context well yeah i i guess it's a series of things you know i think this community around service design um the conversations like this one uh with other people uh I really I like the people who hang out in our little crazy <laughs> little world around service design. I've just made a lot of good relationships and friendships through it and um, and learn so much from everybody. So I would say, yeah, that um, you know the i'm I'm big on continuous learning, and so it's kept me focus on that um i stay i'm still curious and interested in it but a lot of very interesting smart people are attracted to this mm. and it's enriched my life mm. just by being part being part of it um and i'm sure others feel that way too. i'm sure that's why you do this um but uh i i really yeah it's really it's opened up um so many relationships around the world so that's just been very rewarding. Um, and uh, so I, you know, like I said, I'm introverted by nature. So that has gotten me to like, just meet a lot more relationships that way. Mm. Um, and so, and I think that part of enduring service design, a lot of the, uh, the facilitation that's part of it and things like that, um, that has been, uh, you know, pushing my boundaries. I, I think of my practice, how it's evolved over time and uh, the comfort level that I've built over time of just getting into a room of people and seeing what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been great, great too. Being okay with ambiguity. Yeah, yeah. Uncertainty. Well, I, I was always okay with it, but it, yeah, it's just, uh, it's made me more and more comfortable. Mm. Yeah, because you, yeah, you just lean into it. And uh, that there's opportunities to be able to do that um, and then create those opportunities for other people. So, yeah. When we uh, think about uh, building new relationships and expanding the network and meeting interesting people, who's your current design crush? Who is the person that you think, man, I wish I had come up with that? Well, I love Lou's book. So 
good services. Um, I the clarity of that. Mm -hmm. um, we recommend it to people all the time. Um, the the goals of that were different than what Chris and I did, but I uh, hit the nail. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you've heard that from other people. It's just people read that and then start to then really like understand really deeply. And so I just think that is uh, uh, crisp to the point, well-designed book, um, really, really great work. So yeah, I, I would say Lou, if that was just, uh, um, and, and been helpful, similar to the Airbnb thing. It's just something that like makes the practice more accessible. Yeah, to a wide audience beyond yeah. the design community. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, that's one that we, we a, a lot of people here are like, oh, this is great. <laughs> but now you know, Patrick has a design crush on you. So good. <laughs> We're also waiting for the sequel of that one. Definitely a, a classic. So looking again uh, for a brief moment on your life, uh, personal, private, if you got the opportunity to do something over, something to iterate upon, what would what would it be? Anything, <laughs> anything. Yeah. <laughs> what needs an iteration? So many. Well, so many things. We're talking about <laughs> me in general. Uh, no, I. You know, I was mentioning before about um, like the pandemic and taking care of yourself and stuff like that. I don't always do that for myself. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's the biggest thing. I'm. You know, if 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 a, if anyone needs something, I'll be. I'm there. Um, and you know, the, it's trite, but true, put your mask on before you try to put the mask on someone else mm. on an airplane. Mm. So I would say if I could do an iteration for me would be to like build in, which is something I'm working on constantly, but you know, build in better self-care practices mm -hmm. into my routines. I think that's important for anyone. Um, it's definitely tough when you're leading an organization, working with clients. It's even more important in a pandemic. Yeah, exactly. So I would, I would say that's the main thing. And I, I would say, like, you know, I give that advice to people all the time. I should probably take my advice. But what are you, what are you doing? Starting yoga, meditation, physical I, yeah. exercise. Yeah, lots of yoga. Uh, you know, therapy. Like having, being able to have somebody just like listen who, uh, with no judgment, or uh, is awesome uh exercising you know spending more time with friends it's a constant battle um but i'm the tr you know i'm trying to get better and better at it i mean you know like a lot of people i'm ambitious so it's I, it's hard for me to say no mm -hmm. uh but uh but uh, I'm learning. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, you know, I, I have a healthy dose of uh, imposter syndrome. So also just cutting myself a break and uh, be kind, saying it's good and kind. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but yeah, I think that's, I think that's something that, um, you know, building those habits and, and things I'm doing now to get better at that if I had done that years ago. Probably. Mm. You know, be a different person. It's never too late never to too start. Late. No, no, we're that, all a work in progress. So, and yeah. making a habit and maybe a collaborative habit over here, like doing push ups every, uh, every hour with the team. That yeah. would be right. Why not? Why not? So, um, question around harmonic. There have been rumors that there's a secret initiation ritual that involves a unique design task. Can you confirm or deny the existence of that? And if so, what is it? Design task. Mm, I don't know. Maybe I'm not aware of it. <laughs> and if there would would be one, what would it be? Well, one uh, one thing we did. We do have questions we ask people when they when they join. Uh, I think uh, partly because of the pandemic, one of the questions we ask is how tall people are, uh, because we were hiring uh and uh people who uh, we have people staff all over the country and so we had never met in person so that that was one there's a big battle over coffee versus tea here um the tea people are wrong um but uh yeah there's there's a fun little like quiz of, of thing and questions and things that, that we ask just to get to know to know one another and there's a 
a crazy spreadsheet that captures that whole history of everyone that's worked with us. So mm. if you want to know mm. any anyone's height um, or their Myers-Briggs <laughs> score or uh, their favorite food, <laughs> we have a spreadsheet. <laughs> Don't let that get leaked on the internet. Um, Patrick, one of my uh, final questions is if you wouldn't be the current CEO of Harmonic Design, where do you think your career would have taken you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I would still be doing service design. Uh, you know, we, this company emerged out of people who had worked together before working together again. I think if that, if I had like not come back to Atlanta and, and met up with that, that gang again, or if, uh, I, I think I would be maybe trying out what we're seeing uh, with a lot of people in our profession of that solo practitioner, right? Um, but my guess is that I would have gravitated back to then um, wanting to be part of a team. Mm. So, uh, and I'm not sure if it would be internal or external because both have um, both can be good and 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 challenging. But uh, yeah, I th I think. Uh, yeah, probably I'd probably be part of some team somewhere, and uh, and I would be as happy to be a uh, to be doing service design and strategy than leading a team or leading a company. Um, it's just good work. Uh, I I love doing it. Anything outside of the design space? Um, retiring. <laughs> <laughs> and then doing what? Sitting on. Uh, no, I I really want to teach. Um, okay. I have. Uh, you know, we obviously we do a lot of teaching through our, our work, but uh, yeah, I've not had because of running a company. Yeah, I would say I probably would have uh, have been pursuing doing adjunct professorship or um, writing something else, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, that probably would be spending more time on those things. So I hope that's ahead of me. Um, but uh, yeah, running. Yeah, obviously forming a company, leading it. Uh, there's only so much time. So that's what I've said no to at mm. the moment. But mm. yeah, that's still a passion area. Mm. Yeah. So this brings me to our last part of our of our chat. Uh, thanks a lot already for sharing a lot of these insights into who you are, mm -hmm. Patrick, beyond the, the service design professional and also the person. Um, before we go, I want to give you the opportunity. Any last final words of wisdom or shout outs that you want to do? Uh, well, first, I appreciate you coming to town uh, uh, and, and, and not just for harmonic. You know, when I, I, I want to give a shout out to Atlanta. Um, so, you know, maybe outside the US, you know, New York, San Francisco, et cetera. But I, when I was in San Francisco and I moved back here to Atlanta, um, it was not necessarily to form a company, but I knew this would be a good place to do service design. There is a, a really great community here. We are not far from Savannah uh, College of Art and Design, which has a great service design program. Uh, I knew that it that this would be a good place for me personally to be closer to family and friends, but I knew that I would be surrounded by a bunch of talented people who were um, were going to help service design go wherever it was going to go. And so uh, I would say I'd give a shout out to the community here, um, which I know you know a good bit of them, uh, and I'm probably meeting more of them. And uh, if you are, you should consider Atlanta. If you <laughs> are interested in service design, it's a, it's a really, really great group of, a group, group of people here. So um, that, that'll be my shout out. And then of course, to my, my team here who are part of that. But uh, yeah, it's a great place to practice. Yeah, I can second that based on the short experience that I have being here for the last few days. Atlanta definitely seems like a good place for in general for for people but for design the design community uh in general so yeah. especially that's what i wanted to say yeah. patrick uh thanks again for inviting me over for this opportunity to have a in-person conversation rather than doing everything virtually um was was an absolute honor yeah great it's uh awesome to that you're here and 
I wish people on the video could see what you're doing the rest of the week, but maybe you'll be sharing some of that too. <laughs> we'll try to share. So um, you made it this far into our conversation. Thanks for tuning in to the Service Design Show. I hope you enjoyed it. Please keep making a positive impact and I'll catch you very soon in the next episode. Let's shake hands. Yeah.